Yeah, we're going. Okay, guys. So I'm going to leave you here with Steven Rodriguez. He's going to be presenting a Do More With Less, combining small findings to make a big impact. All right, so I'm a penetration tester at Coal Fire, based out of uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, I do like to blog. My blog was there on the first page, but I'll also have it at the end as well. Uh, just a little bit about me. I've been testing for about a year, been in security a few years. Uh, personal time, I like cars, uh, firearms. I like to say I like things that are just loud and fast. So what is this talk about? So the point of this talk is to go and how we can look at findings during a penetration test and not just look at these high and criticals to assess our risk, but actually look into these lower or medium level findings to find additional attack surface uh, to compromise a network. I'm going to be talking about cross-site scripting. Um, a lot of times I see cross-site scripting in penetration tests and, and bug bounties just used to you know, pop an alert box or something like that just for a proof of concept, but you can actually use it to do a lot offensively. So I'm going to talk about some of the ways you can use that uh, to actually make a good exploit. Uh, I'm also going to talk about pivoting uh, between networks, uh, because that's something we often do on pen tests. And I've developed a couple offensive tools uh, that I use for penetration testing, and I'm going to introduce them here. So who is the target audience? Uh, this talk is going to be about penetration testing. Uh, if you're interested in penetration testing or you perform penetration testing, um, there will be a lot of information for you. Uh, I, I assume you know a little bit about the pen testing methodology, a little bit about the OWASP top 10 and Metasploit as well. So I'm going to start out with the scenario. So say you're on a penetration test, and again, because of uh, reasons like time, uh, you need to do go and quickly scan and enumerate uh, the vulnerabilities of the environment, you run a Nessa scan. So the Nessa scan comes back and you don't really have any high or critical findings to go off of. Uh, the next thing uh, testers will often do is run a tool like Responder, try to find these broadcast protocols for you know, NetBIOS and LLM, LLM and R to do some spoofing and capture some hashes. But in this scenario, let's say that doesn't work either. So what do you do when you find yourself in a situation where you have no high findings, you have no broadcast protocols, and you need to compromise the network? So here are some useful findings uh, that you'll find in Nessus. And most of these are only info, uh, but they can actually tell you a lot about the network, and you can actually dig in and find a lot more things that you can use uh, to exploit the network. So right here, uh, hypertext transport uh, protocol information this will tell you that like HTTP methods, HTTP uh, server type and version, it'll sh you know, let you know, is it IIS, Apache, uh, service detection. This is like your banner grabbing in Nmap. You can find out what types of services are running on what port. Um, additional DNS host names. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to discover this, um, but sometimes you, you know, if you're doing this manually, looking at the X509 certificate, on an HTTPS enabled website, we'll show you that host name. Also, uh, FQDN resolution, uh, doing like reverse DNS lookups can give you the host name. And a DNS zone transfer, I see these on internals often, uh, not as often on the external network, but if you can perform a zone transfer, it'll give you every DNS entry for that domain, which can be really useful because most of the time, the names of the servers correspond with their function. So it can help you quickly zone in on what you want to attack. Uh, all this information, all these findings are for Nessus, but you can also enumerate this same information using Nmap or other tools. So I'm going to talk a little bit about vHost. So virtual hosting, uh, it exists because a lot of times people want to host multiple websites on one server. It saves resources. Um, and, and the way that the web server knows which vHost you want to talk to is because in an HTTP, pa HTTP packet, you have a header in the request called the host header, and that lets the server know which one you want to talk to. And de if you, depending on what you supply for that host header, will the server will have a different response. So 
uh, here's an example of using Durbuster. So Durbuster and Nic Nicto are both tools that are often used for enumerating web applications. So here we have an IP address and we run Durb against it. We don't really see a lot, but we see this uh, server status page because it returns with the code 200, which means that there's uh, something there. So if we go look at it, we see this a Apache server status page. And just looking at it, it looks like a lot of you know, debug information, usually something that the actual uh, sysadmin or web administrator would want. But what we can see here is an information leak. So we see there's this vhost column, and then here we can see that there's a noopy.localhost on this server. So what we can do is we can go back, and if we run derb or nicto again, we actually get different results. So this is hitting the exact same server, but because we supplied that host header, or derb supplies that host header, we see these different directories that popped up that we couldn't see before. Uh, so what we saw there is we see WP admin, WP content, WP includes. So these are indicative of a WordPress install. Uh, so if you haven't heard of WordPress, it's an open source content management system. It's used by bloggers. It's used by a lot of different websites out there. I think something like 20% of the internet is actually uh, running off of the WordPress platform. Uh, and what makes it really interesting to me as an attacker is because there's a lot of security vulnerabilities that have been associated with it. Uh, some of the biggest vulnerabilities are not from the WordPress core, but from the plugins that people install uh, on their WordPress website. So WordPress plugins uh, can be just downloaded from the store or downloaded anywhere and installed, and they're not necessarily created by people with any background in secure programming. So oftentimes they're plagued with vulnerabilities. So if you're attacking a WordPress website, you probably will go straight to WP scan because that's the most popular and probably best WordPress uh, scanning tool there is right now. Um, so Word WP scan can do a couple different things. Uh, you can use it to enumerate users. You can use it to brute force accounts. You can use it to enumerate plugins. Um, I also have a tool. This one's mine here, WP force. It's also a brute force tool. Uh, but instead of using the login form to brute force, it uses the API, uh, which is, acts mostly the same, but say if for something there's a, a CAPTCHA on the login form, by attacking the API, you can then bypass that. Um, so for this demo, I'm just gonna use WP scan, and I'm gonna use the dash dash enumerate P, which will enumerate all the plugins and their associated uh, security vulnerabilities. So when I run WP scan, I'll get a list of all the different vulnerabilities. Um, and I'll try to pick the one that I think is the best, probably the one that I can exploit the most eas easily. Yep. Yeah, so the question was, how do I know which ones are better, which ones are good? So the things I look for first um, are unauthenticated because I'm usually coming from the internet or outside, so I want uh, an attack that I don't have to be logged in to perform. Also, I typically want to look first for something like command injection or SQL injection since those are the most devastating. Uh, in this case, all we have uh, is cross-site scripting is the biggest one we have here. But I see that this one, if you can't read it, it's a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability. Uh, and there's also a reference to an exploit DB article. So stored, stored cross-site scripting is really cool and it's better than reflected cross-site scripting in a lot of ways. So reflected cross-site scripting has a couple issues where uh, you actually need to feed someone some link or somehow entice someone to uh, visit a particular URL to trigger it. So there's a little bit of a social engineering involved. Uh, also, it gets blocked by a lot of modern browsers. Most modern browsers have detections and can block against uh, reflected cross-site scripting, but they can't block against stored. Uh, it's persistent, so it's actually stored on the web server that you attack. 
Um, so you don't have to feed it to one person. You just put it there, and then anyone who browses to it is affected by it. And cross-site scripting, uh, you, you're basically putting JavaScript code into the target website. So the JavaScript is almost limitless in what it can do uh, within the browser. So any action a normal authorized user could perform, you could entice them to do it uh, by using JavaScript. So right here, uh, we, s yes? So I, the question was about cross-site scripting in this case, is they log in as admin into their WordPress installation, and then they go to the plugin that's vulnerable, which in this case is the activity log. So in that red box you can see there, there's an IP column. So within that IP column is actually that JavaScript code that I supplied in the X forwarded for header. So on my server, I'll see a callback to go grab my remote JavaScript file which will perform those malicious actions. The end result is that on the target website, we can get a brand new admin account created in WordPress. So in that way, we can now have, and it's got a bunch of different modules. Uh, it can dump password hash, and the Yurtle shell itself is also persistent. So to get an interpreter shell with Yurtle, uh, you need to set up a handler in Metasploit. Uh, it uses a PHP meterpreter reverse TCP. Uh, so in Yurtle, we just type directing it at the 192 network, which we don't have direct access to, but because we are tunneling to that session one, we can now port scan that environment. And we can see here, uh, it actually finds an open port on this dot .138 IP on port 22, which is SSH. So Metasploit can also be used for credential attacks. So right here, we know we have an open port. We know it's on this internal network. So those credentials that we were able to recover earlier through the cracking, we can start spraying those against SSH to see if any of those are able to authenticate. So right here, I try uh, Ed Rodriguez with the password, I like tacos. And we can see we now have a, another Metasploit session, a command shell session open. So this module automatically give you a shell as soon as it finds valid credentials. So if we want to upgrade uh, that regular command shell session to a meterpreter session, we can use this other module uh, called shell to meterpreter. Uh, so basically we just specify what session and then it will go and take that regular command shell and then turn it into a meterpreter session which has a lot more functionality than a simple command shell. Um, so when I was looking into this module, I really liked it, but I noticed it did have one downside, is that when you do it, it actually uh, writes some files to disk through that command shell in order to pop the uh, meterpreter session. <laughs> um, so I, thought, I was thinking, what's another way I can, I can do that without actually having to write to disk? So going back to the pivoting section, when you create that route, it's great, but you can only route Metasploit modules through it. What if you want to route any tool through that session? And the way you can do that is by creating a SOX proxy. So what a SOX proxy will do is it'll just take any TCP traffic and just direct it uh, to whatever you want. In this case, it'll create a dynamic redirect, so any traffic to any port uh, will be sent through there. So Metasploit, you use this module, you can verify uh, it's working with netstat by just doing a netstat-nao and you see port 9000 is listening so you can see your SOX proxy is up and running. So to send traffic uh, through a SOX proxy, you can use a tool called proxy chains. And all proxy chains does is it will just take the network traffic from anything and just send it through the SOX proxy. So to configure that, for example, on Kali Linux, in the etsy proxychains.conf file, uh, you can put the IP import of your SOX proxy. So I'm going to go to another tool. Uh, this was one I created called Huacha, and it's a Linux and Mac OS exploitation tool uh, that works through SSH. So one of the really cool things about it is 
actually execute shell code in memory without ever touching disk. It can go to a wide range of systems and start harvesting uh, bash history files or any files. Um, it can go and grab the RSA private keys off systems so you can start pivoting to more systems. And you can also use uh, other things like Mimipenguin, which is a memory credential scraping Python script to go and grab plain text passwords out of memory if you have root access, sort of like Mimikatz on Windows. So to use Hawatcha in this case, I'm gonna go proxy chains, uh, then run my Python scope with, with all my options. So right here, I'm using Meterpreter, and I'm gonna do a 64-bit payload. So you can easily get Meterpreter sessions with PHP or with Python uh, just by using a one-liner. But the great thing about using these uh, native architecture uh, Meterpreter payloads is the Meterpreter session you get has a lot more functionality uh, than you would with, say, a Python or PHP Meterpreter. Uh, for example, like recording the webcam is something that you can do with the native Meterpreter that you can't do with the Python or PHP one. So uh, we tunnel it through and we see this um, S chain in the white there. It's letting us know that we're going through that proxy chains defined SOX proxy. So if, if you can't read it, it says S chain uh, 127.001.9000. That's our local listening SOX proxy. And then it's going to the 192.168.250.138, which was our remote host that we identified through pivoting. So we come here and we get a shell. So here's Metasploit. We have a handler listening for Linux uh, x64. Um, so at the end result, we get two shells. We have the PHP one that we got with Yurtle, and then we also have this native 64-bit native 64 interpreter shell. Um, and we got that without ever having to actually touch the system on disk. So if they had um, antivirus or uh, tripwire or some sort of endpoint monitoring tools, uh, this likely wouldn't be detected. So I covered a lot with this talk and I went kind of fast. So if there was anything in there that was maybe confusing or that I went over too quick, I was curious if you had any questions uh, that I could further explain. Here's some of the things we, we covered. Yeah, so the question was, how does Yurtle stay persistent? So Yurtle, and I just talked bad about writing to disk, Yurtle writes to disk. So Yurtle is actually a WordPress plugin, and it will be available within the WordPress plugin directory, uh, and it will also show up in the console unless you run the stealth command, which will keep it on the server, but will remove it from the WordPress UI. So uh, my website is nuki.io. Uh, I have a lot of blog posts that go in more in depth with some of these other tools. Uh, that's also the link to my GitHub. I have uh, WordPress, uh, the Yurtle and WP Force. They also have Hawacha up there. If you have any uh, pull requests, comments, you want to try it out, um, please feel free. Um, yeah, any any questions after the talk, feel free to come up to me and. I'd love to talk about pen testing or any of my tools or just, you know, doge memes or, or whatever you're interested in. Thanks. <laughs>